Uh, if you have any questions as we're going through, um, if you could please add them to the chat window and Hayley, my glamorous assistant, will be able to keep note of them and um, if it suits at the time we'll try and incorporate them and otherwise we'll leave them till the end of the session and have a bit of a Q&A um, session then. Okay, so um, let's make a start. Um, I'll start with an agenda, so here's what I'm planning to, to cover today. We're going to start with an introduction to FME and non-spatial data. And really that's for anyone who's joining us today who's not really an FME user but is looking to explore it and find out what it's about. Most of the session, however, will be demonstrating examples. So I'm assuming for, this, for that part that you have some knowledge and experience with FME. So we're going to be looking at things like non-spatial formats, working between spatial and non-spatial data, and then manipulating the non-spatial parts, so the attributes in our data. And that's really the, the focus of today's session. Okay, so to start with a little background, firstly on one spatial. Well, we've been in the market since 1969, and currently we have offices in the UK, Ireland, in, and Australia. And I'm speaking to you today from our Cambridge offices. Um, we work with many, many customers from all over the world and in many varying sectors. So we've got just a, a selection here of some of the ones that we're currently working with, to get, just to give you an idea. Uh, of course, we work very closely with Safe Software, and these are the makers of the FME product itself. They're based in Vancouver, and we're part of their global network of resellers and partners. An FME is used all over the world and is generally considered the global leader in spatial data transformation. And today we're going to look at some of its capabilities with non-spatial data. In terms of our FME credentials here at One Spatial, uh, we've been a value-added reseller for over 10 years and we have the greatest number of FME certified professional trainers and professionals uh, globally. So if you're interested in any of our FME services, then please contact us. Uh, our general contact address is fme at onespatial.com um, and we'll be able to, to help you out. Okay, so very brief introduction to FME uh, itself. It stands for Feature Manipulation Engine and in a nutshell, it's a tool for data interoperability. So it's allowing us to move data between different data stores, so different formats, and transform that data along the way. And we generally think of it as a central engine linking to multiple data formats. So we can move data from one format to the other, say from CSV files to Oracle tables, and FME understands the limitations and the possibilities of each of those formats. Um, so that's it in a very briefly. If you're interested in finding out more about it, you can check, check the SAFE website um, and look at some of their documentation. But here I'm just giving a very brief overview. What do you get with FME? Well, again, very briefly, um, FME Desktop has a number of components. Uh, you can see them listed here. The ones we are uh, interested in today, certainly, are the FME Viewer, which we'll take a brief look at uh, with regard to spatial data. But mostly we'll be working with FME Workbench, which is like the workhorse of, of the desktop application. It's where we build our processes. It's where we'll be transforming our data. Okay, so introduction's over. Let's get started. So what do we mean by non-spatial data? Well, it's data with no spatial references, so no geometry, but we can, of course, have indirect spatial references. So things like our contact management systems, patient records, text files, spreadsheets, databases, and the kind of stuff that we see a lot on, um, say, the data.gov.uk website. So if you're on the last session, you have been looking at, at some of the data sets there, and a lot of that data is non-spatial. Why is it important? Well, most of our data sets are non-spatial, 
and in fact even spatial data sets have non-spatial components, so the attributes, the, the things that are storing the values that are of interest to us. It's also a very common exchange format, simple text files you know, that allow us to, tra to tra move data from one format um, and one store to another. And of course, everyone's using it, so it's an important uh, feature that we need to be able to work with. Uh, so what can we do with non-spatial data in FME? Well, firstly, we can view it with the Universal Viewer. So it's the exact same as spatial data. We don't need any special application. We use our Universal Viewer as before. The thing to note, though, is that we use the Select Node Geometry tool uh, when we've got non-spatial data and then the attributes, the values, are displayed on the right-hand side. Um, just for note, I'm sure you know, you use the select geometry when we have, indeed, um, data with geometry. What else? Well, we can read and write data to and from lots of non-spatial formats. So we have things like text files, CSV files, some of our standard database files, like Oracle, MySQL, and so on. Twitter accounts, Google Fusion tables, there's lots of them there. And you can check the SAFE website um, for non-spatial formats. If you have some data, check if, if it's available there. And of course, we have lots and lots of transformers that work with non-spatial data, so work with the attributes. And here I've listed some of the more common ones, or certainly the ones I use. Um, and we'll be looking at some of these today, so some of the things like the joiner, the expression evaluator, the list indexer, the attribute splitter, and so on. If you're looking for them in the transformer gallery, so in, in your FME workbench, the categories to look for are the database, strings, and lists categories. But hopefully you'll become familiar with them as we're starting to use them. And why would you want to use FME? Well, we have the same familiar intuitive interface, uh, which is always a positive, and no SQL or database JEDI skills are required. So, you know, you can do this without having to have a degree in um, IT or whatever, because certainly I don't. Although if you do have database skills, then they're certainly helpful, and you, you have certain transformers that you can use those with. So it can be useful. Okay, so let's start with our first demo. Here we're looking at reading and writing some non-spatial formats. And just before we jump into FME, I just wanted to show you some of the files that we're going to be working with. So here we've got a text file, so we're going to be using the TXT text reader. Um, this is what our te text files look like pretty standard format. We have some cat data, so that's column aligned text. This is what this looks like, and this is a new reader in FME 2012 that allows you to read this very simply, so we'll take a look at that. And then we've got some CSV files, and that's just your comma separated values, and um, you can also have them separated by, by other values, but the most common, if you like, is your comma separated. So we'll be looking at some some of those right about now. So if I jump over to FME and I go get my first workbench. So I've just set myself up some bookmarks to remember what to show you. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the text reader and get some data for there. So here I have a simple gazetteer file. If I look in the parameters, I can choose all the defaults for now. So let's click OK on that. And my feature type gets added to my canvas. If I just add a logger and quickly show you what's happening here. So if I write the data out, first thing you can see is 27 records, 
And all of my data, so this was the gazetteer, so the address information, it's all been shoved into that one attribute field. Okay, if I just disable that, if I now look again at this file and let's just alter some of the parameters that we have. So I'm going to add my text file again. And in the parameters, one that you may be interested in is this read the whole file at once. So if we quickly demonstrate this. What's happening this time, we'll see, is that we're getting just a single record um, being written. And all the data has been shoved into that one attribute on the text file. Um, so this is quite this particular feature is quite useful if you've got a text file that of a format that isn't supported directly by FME. You can use this method to just shove the data in and then you use your transformers and so on to then manipulate the data and, and do what you want with it. So it's a quite a useful feature. Just move this out of the way. Okay, next up, let me this one. We've got some cat data, so some column aligned text. And I said this is a new feature of uh, 2012. So you can see here you can choose a column aligned text format. If I choose my text file, and in here if we look at the parameters, well, let's see. Um, so my number of lines to skip, uh, my field names are in my file. Maybe before I do that, I'll just choose the columns. So a bit like you'd be used to in Excel or something like that, you can mark where the column breaks are to appear. Let's move this across. be a little bit tricky. Okay, I've then got some field names in my file, so I can turn those on, and then I can alter the data type that I'm setting up. So my nest ID, these are going to be integers, date laid, integers, and so on. You can also then omit fields that you don't want to bring in, so if you don't want to bring in a particular field, you just tick them on or off. Or if you want to omit particular records from the data, then you can use this filtering feature to do that. So lots of options um, on the cat reader. Um, really useful if you have this kind of data. Let's pull our logger down. And we can see we get quite a number of records. And we're getting each of the attributes with their associated values. So really what you would expect. Okay, so the other file that we said we had was a CSV file. So let's go and try adding some CSV data. So if I go into my formats gallery, I'll choose comma separated values. Let's go find my file. And it's a sample of the points of interest data. Let's choose that. Let's click on the parameters. Let's see what we've got. Well, our separator character here is the comma. So if we chose the wrong separator, you can see here what would happen. So we're choosing the separator as the comma. That's pushing each of the fields, um, each of the values in the fields we'd expect. And we also have then that we want to remove um, or add field names and strip the quotes. So we'll click OK on that. OK, and here I've got my reader. Let's just connect my logger up to it. So I potentially have many, many um, records in this data set. So something I want to do is limit the number of features that I read in. So this is uh, something you can do on any of your data sets. In my advanced um, section, max features to read, well, let's say five. 
and now I should get five records have been read in. And again, it's as you'd expect, each of my attributes given their value. Okay. Something else um, that came in, in in 2012 is the ability to limit the attributes that are exposed here on your reader. So you can see at the moment it's quite a, a rich data set. If we're only interested in a number of these um, attributes, then we can turn them on and off as, as we wish. So let's say I want to choose just a few um, the admin boundary. I click OK. I can see now that they're reduced on, on the reader. They're actually still being read in. So if I right out to the logger at this point, we're still getting all the all the values. But where it is useful is when you're working with the data after this point in, in the workbench. So if I add a transformer, let's say the attribute renamer, um, I now have a much smaller list of attributes to choose from. Let's say I want to rename my and so on. Okay, so that's reading in some of the text file formats. What about writing out to those formats? Well, if we have a look at the Excel writer, so that's quite a common one, one that we're, we're generally looking to use. Let's add one in. So if we go to our writers, add writer, let's choose Excel. We need to set the destination, so put it in this output folder. I happen to have a file already, so I'm just going to choose in here to overwrite the file. Okay, would I like to add a feature type? Yes, I will. And I'll just call it that for now, and let's pop that in there. Okay, so one thing I can do is, let's get rid of this logger, I can now right click on this and copy the attributes from the transformer. So let's choose the attribute renamer and now I'm getting the attributes on my writer. Excel files though can have multiple tabs. So one thing we'd like to do is have multiple tabs, we'd like whichever data sets appear in different districts to appear on different tabs within our Excel file. So we can do this using a fan out, and if we fan out on that attribute, that's exactly what will happen. So this means that there will be a feature type for every district, and in Excel terms that means a tab. So there will be multiple tabs in this output Excel file. So let's run it, and let's have a look at what happens. So if I get my Excel file. Ah, you can see we've got just one, which is because I've limited the number of records. Let's alter that. And now, of course, I'm experiencing Okay, so we can see we have, for each district, our records have been filtered into different tabs on our Excel file. So that can be a very simple but useful way of um, writing your data into Excel files. It could be, you know, you could be doing it by year and so on. Okay, so that's um, to a flat file, if you like. We could also write out to some database formats. So let me go get one if we want to write out to Oracle, for example. Let's go find an Oracle writer. I 
just lose my local server. Okay, what you can see here in the Oracle Writer that's important is the format parameters. So we can choose to create a table to drop the existing table, which we typically want to do. So it will drop the existing table like a trigger at the start and then populate it. But you can see also that we're missing um, many formats that if you're used to using the Oracle Spatial Writer, uh, many of the format parameters are not here because they're not needed. There's no geometry and so there's no need to create metadata. So this time I'm going to copy some attributes from my, well let's just do it again from my transformer. And let's just play it again. And we can see that we have records. So if I look in my Oracle database, I've now got records appearing in my new feature type. Okay, so it's just pushing the data into the different formats and you look at the particulars for that format. So we could do the same for Postgres, um, but it's, it's the same principles here. So we're reading non-spatial data in different formats and we're able to write it out non-spatial data in different formats. Okay, so if I move back to uh, our next demonstration, so we want to move on now to look at processing our data. So we want to make um, some of our non-spatial data spatial. So here we've got some GPS data that we've collected and we want to generate the track geometry. So we're going to read in the text file. You can see it here, it's got some headers. Uh, so it'll just be another option to show you. We're then going to create the points, create the lines, and then save that as a custom format that we can reuse. Okay, so if I jump over to my FME. Okay, so first thing we need to do is go get that data set. So if we add a reader and we choose our CSV format, this GPS points data set, let's have a look at the parameters. While it's a comma separator, we need to strip the quotes. Our file has field names, and we want the field names to follow the header. The number of lines we're going to skip is four at the start and one at the end. Okay, and you can see here in the preview window what it's going to look like. So really useful um, preview. When we're happy with that, we can click OK. And we have our feature type on the canvas. So we want to create some points. So we can use the 2D point replacer. And then we want to sort those um, to be able to create, create uh, some tracks. So in my point replacer, I've set up my X value and my Y value. Here I'm going to sort by root and by point ID. And if we have a quick look at that, you can see what we're getting is all the points. So remember this is coming from a CSV file, so with no geometry associated with it, and we've now created some geometry. We now want to create the lines, so that's joining up points. So we'll use a point connector. 
And we want to break the line then at a particular point, and that point will be identified by the root. So we want all of the roots with the same ID to um, become a single line. Oops, and I've done it wrong. Oh, great. Okay, this is where I go to my backup plan and show you one that I've completed. We write this out to the inspector. So I've just chosen one of the wrong attributes here. And what we're getting is all the points being joined together um, as their lines. Okay, so let's imagine I've got lots and lots of these um, files. I've got people out collecting this GPS data for me. Um, so I'm going to encounter this issue over and over again. So one thing that's really useful would be to save this little mini process as a custom format. So it's very simple to do. You can do it here by going File, Export as Custom Format. You then need to give it a name. And this will now get get saved on your local system. Okay, and while that's thinking about it, um, what I shall do is show you what that looks like if you then search for it. So if I now in my readers go and search for my GPS, you can see this is the one I had stored from earlier, and I choose my points file, so my CSV file, and I can immediately write that out to the visualizer and in the background it's doing that mini process of connecting the points, um, creating points, connecting the points and drawing the lines. So really useful way, very simple to do, creative custom format. Okay. So back to our um, presentation and on to our next example. And in this example we're going to take a very simple spiratial process. So hopefully you can see we're building on these all the time so that the examples will get um, more involved uh, as we go along. But here we're still dealing with a very simple spatial process which is geocoding and we're going to output um, some non-spatial data as part of that spatial process. So we're geocoding some postcode data, so that's our spatial process, and then we want to report on the errors uh, and write out a text file, so validating and writing a validation report. Okay, so the spatial process here, well, we can say we're going to be um, taking our uh, code point here, so this containing our postcode geometries, we need to format the field um, so that it's in a suitable format, so it looks a bit like, like this. And then we've got our file, our non-spatial data. It's um, just some postcodes, and we're reading it in, and we're using the feature merger to merge the geometry onto our data. So let me get rid of Okay, so here we go. This is um, what I was explaining. Um, the thing that's of interest to us uh, 
with non-spatial data is that we're here, we're, we are manipulating the attributes, so we need to format the postcode field. So some of the transformers we're using here um, are ones that you'll encounter over and over, so the substring extractor. So it's a transformer that allows you extract substrings from your values. Okay, does what it says on the tin, I guess. So the first thing we want to do is rebuild the postcode values that we have. So we're going to identify the end part and the start part. So here we're saying um, start three from the end, minus three, and go to the end, which is minus one. So that's putting the last three characters into an end attribute. Similarly then, we've got a start attribute, and we're taking the first character down as far as the last from the last fourth from the end. Okay, so everything that wasn't captured before, we're putting in a start. And we're then using a string concatenator. The so string concatenator is really useful when we're dealing with, with non-spatial data. It simply allows us to stick bits of values together. So we've got our start, we're putting in a space, and then we've got our end. So it's really matching that postcode uh, format that that we would expect. So if we quickly hit play on this, and let's see what happens. Okay, so our feature merger, which is doing our geocoding for us, we can see of our 31 records, we're getting only 18 matches. So only 18 are referenced, and we've got 10 unreferenced. So, um, they're the ones we're interested in. We want to check if they're, if they're valid. Let me, sorry, move between programs again. So let's just go back to explain what we're going to do. So we want to write out this validation report. So what we're going to do is test the postcode values are valid. Then we're going to output the invalid records and then output some summary stats. We want to get some counts on how many issues there are, the types of issues, and also some percentages. Okay, so let's go get our workbench. Okay, you can see the top part up here as before, we're now interested in this bottom part, which is dealing with this, the validation report, so checking our postcodes are valid. So the first thing we're going to do is use this UK postcode validator. So you'll be familiar with this from the last session um, where it was displayed, but basically it's checking the format of a postcode matches the UK rules. Okay, so we're pushing our data in there. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is any that are valid, let's put them back up to the feature merger so they get their geometry attached. So that's that dealt with. But here we're more interested in what's coming out of the invalid port, so the ones that have got problems. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is write those records out. So let's write them out here to an Excel file. Okay, so I've already got this set up. I have an Excel file here. Here I'm just renaming some of the attributes I get out. So I'm going to be told the postcode, the result, whether it's valid or invalid, and then the issue. So things like, is there an issue at the start? Is there an issue at the end? And so on. So information to help us. You'll notice here I've got two feature types in my Excel uh, writer, but I have just one Excel writer here. Okay, so it's again this idea that I can have multiple tabs in my Excel file um, because each tab is a feature type. Okay, so that's that side sorted. I'm going to get a list of all the um, postcodes that have got issues. Next thing I want to do is calculate some stats. So let's use the stats calculator pop that in there, and my invalid, I'm going to start another data flow, and into the stats calculator, I'm going to look at the result issue. Um, okay, I want to group these by the result issue, so say if there's three different types, I'd get 
counts for each, and I want to calculate the count for each of those. Okay, so it's only the count here that I'm concerned with, so this should give me the um, count of issues. Let's just disable my writer for now. Okay, and here we can see that of our 31 um, postcode values coming in, I've got 22 that are valid and going off to be geocoded, and then I've got 9 that be, are being written out and are coming into this stats calculator. So I can see I've got different results issues and then counts of how many of those occur. Okay, so I've got a count of each of the issues. I want to calculate the percentage, so I need to know what's the total number of records in my data set. So really here, I don't want to pass the features through. I want to leave this so that instead of getting nine out, each of them telling me uh, what's happening, I want to see just how many result issues, so I want a record being written out for each result issue. So here I can see this result issue blanks, I get four, but there's an issue at the final part, I get one, and so on. However, it means I've lost all the other attributes here on the stats calculator. So what I need to do is calculate my total number of values prior to that point. So if I use another stats calculator, but I put it here near the start. Here are my attribute. Let's just and if we use this as total count, so I want this to calculate my 31 records. This is now going to be removed by at this point here, so I need to set a variable and then retrieve that value later on. So if I use a variable setter, um, let's make that total count. Let's check I've got it. Call the right thing. And then after this point here, I want to get that value back. So let's use the variable retriever to now retrieve that value. And it becomes uh, available again in our flow. It does if I've set it up properly. Okay, so here we should see the total count is not working. Sorry, just let me go and get, get it with the correct values in. Okay, so here I have the variable setter set with the total count, and then I'm retrieving it as the total count here. And if we set up our logger, let's disable these two for a minute. Then at this point, we should be able to see okay, so we have our total count of 31 and then our count of issues um, being captured in the same value. So next, what we're doing is we're calculating the percentage. So we have our expression evaluator here, which takes the count, so that's the number um, of issues, occurrences of issues. We're dividing by the total count, and then we're just multiplying by 100. Okay. Something to be aware of, though, with the expression evaluator is the, the format of the numbers going in. So if they're integers, the output will be integers, and so on. 
So what we're using here is an attribute rounder before the expression evaluator. And we're just rounding those to two decimal places. So we're effectively forcing two decimal places onto our numbers. And we have the same problem then when we output that we're going to have this very long um, decimal number. So again, we can use the attribute rounder and round that up. Or just to show you uh, another transformer that you can use, it's the string formatter. And the string formatter will allow you to change the format of of your values, but here, if we use 0.2D, then we're telling it to set it to a decimal uh, type with two places. And if you just read the transformer description on that, you'll get more information. So that's it, pretty much. We've now got our output stats. Again, like previously, we're just doing a bit of um, attribute renaming, and then our data is ready to, to write out Let's quickly write that out, and we get some errors. Why are we getting some errors? I don't think the demo gods are shining on me today. Let's quickly try that again. Okay. Don't know where my file has gone, but you get the idea, hopefully, and we would have two tabs in our Excel file at the end. Okay. Um, let's move on, shall we? And start to look at more attribute manipulation. So this is working with the non-spatial, again, the non-spatial parts of your file, so the attributes, the bits with no geometry. And we have a, another example here to demonstrate this. Um, and this one is looking at preparing some CRM files for import into Salesforce. So it could be any CRM um, or any data sets that you're using. This is just the example we're going to, to work with. So here we want to cleanse the data and set it to the required schema. Okay, so in this example, we're going to work with just one of the input data sets. Um, you could, of course, have multiple data sets. But it's basically to show you the, the principles of it. So firstly, we're going to set up the schema and the attributes. Then we'll validate and cleanse some of those attribute values. Um, we then do things like standardize those values, so use some transformers for that. And then we're going to look at removing some duplicates, so identifying them, removing them, and so on. And finally, we'll take a look at the new Salesforce writer. And this is something that's coming in FME 2013. So if you go on to the, the beta program, um, you can access that and have a sneak preview um, and look at that. OK, so back to um, FME, and let's have a look at this example. Okay, so we've got an Excel file here, um, just some address records. If we pop it down, you can see that it has things like name, um, company, address, telephone, email, and so on. So it's the, the kind of data that we're dealing with. And on our output, so our writer is a CSV file. Okay, so it's going from non-spatial to non-spatial. Um, and we've got two files on our output. One is the accounts, and the other is contacts. Okay, and it's set up to match the uh, schema required for sales for, force. So the first thing we want to do, uh, pretty standard, is remove any unwanted attributes. So we use the attribute renamer, and we can do that uh, there. We then want to set up our output schema, so add any attributes that we need uh, for um, the output. So some required fields, for example, 
like owner ID, which is going to contain the sales manager. We need to create those. We may need to rename some of the fields so that they match the, the schema that we're importing into. So some pretty standard um, stuff that you should be well familiar with. Okay, next thing I want to do is cleanse some of my data. So um, this particular data set I was working with, um, I happened to get lots of um, incorrectly imported uh, text files. So you'll see things like this uh, with ampersands and tildes and so on. So what I've done is created myself a custom transformer that deals with all these. Okay, and there are lots and lots of them. But basically, they're using string replacers to search for particular values and then replacing them with a value that I decide is correct. Okay, so lots and lots of different string um, replacers, but it's all bundled up into my custom transformer. So I'm going to cleanse the text there. I'm then going to look at formatting and ch or testing the format of particular uh, attribute values. So here I'm looking at the email and the values that appear in my email um, data. So here I'm using a string searcher, okay, and I'm using some regular expressions to say if my email um, is valid or not. So depending on how familiar you are with regular expressions, this may look, um, uh, this may make sense or not. Basically, I'm saying I can have any letters, dots, or numbers any amount of times. Then I must have an at symbol. Then again, I can have the same letters, numbers, and so on, any number of times. Then I must have a dot symbol. And then to finish, I must have any number of letters and dots. So to get your dot com, dot uk, and so on. Okay, so from the string searcher, I'm getting basically my match, my, my valid, or my invalid. When they're invalid, I'm simply removing them. So I'm setting email to be blank, and then I'm writing myself some information. Um, to, to val on the validation. Okay, and then I'm just tidying up after myself by removing some of the attributes that have been created here by the string searcher. Okay, and it's a pretty similar thing then. I'm going and testing the phone format. So here I pretty much want everything to be numbers, yeah. I don't want names and alph um, alphas and so on appearing in my phone um, value. So here, first thing I'm doing is copying phone into a new attribute, so one that I can test, and I'm again using the string replacer. Okay? But what I'm doing here is I'm removing some kind of expected characters that are norm may appear in the, the phone and be valid. So things like pluses, hyphens, square brackets, curly brackets, uh, or round brackets, and so on. Okay? Again, using regular expressions. Once I've removed those, from my phone number, I should now have just numbers. Okay, that's the logic behind this. I can then use the attribute classifier. Okay, and the attribute classifier is allowing me to test the phone and say what types of data should be in there. So I've chosen integer, so they should all be numbers. And again, if they fail, I'm going to remove the values and so on. I then go and do the same for the postcode. So we use that um, postcode validation checker that we mentioned before. And the last one I'm going to check is the name. Okay, so that the first name and the last name, um, various things. But the main thing I'm doing here is that the first name and the last name are alphabetic. Okay, so doing some checks there. So once I've cleaned up my data, next thing I want to do is possibly populate some values that aren't, are missing. So I've got a couple of transformers I use for that. The first one here, I want to standardize some company names. So useful one here is the attribute value mapper. So this is allowing me to say, if my company name is EA, change it to Environment Agency. If it's OSGB, change it to Ordnance Survey GB. If it's OS Space GB, change it to Ordnance Survey GB, and so on. Okay, so the attribute value mapper um, is a good one to use for that. I've also then got some um, lookup tables that I want to reference. So say I have for, for all my companies, I have a list which tells me which account manager they, they go to. So this is this owner 
idea that we said was a required field at the start. So that's in an external file, so it's in a CSV file. So what I can use here is the joiner, okay? And the joiner, we use it when we're not reading in the, all the files into, into our canvas. So we have just our um, CRM sample Excel, the CSV file that we're now referencing, which contains the sales manager information, we're going to reference at this point and only read it in here. So we can choose our... Our file here, we can see it's the sales manager, CSV. I can choose company as the ID there, and I match up company and company. So this is the pair, the, the unique ID that will join them. And then I want to pull across the owner, so that's the extra field that I want to add. I then must decide which type of um, join I have. So in this case, I've got a, a one, uh, two, one, so we'll just click OK on that, and click OK on that. And in my joined then, we can see that I'll now have a joined owner ID. So I've now added that information into my data flow, and here I'm simply renaming it um, to, to what the schema needs it to be. So we can use um, those two transformers, the attribute value mapper and the joiner, quite useful for that. Next thing I want to do is identify and remove duplicates. Okay, so I'm looking for companies that are in there a number of times and I'm trying to remove them so that I can clean up my data set and keep just the one. So I'll do it on companies and then I do it on, on email. Okay, so for multiple emails. So Matcher here is a very useful transformer. I simply choose the selected attributes that I want. So here I've got my company and then I can choose if I want to um, specify attributes that must differ. So if they must have differing address records, then I can choose this here. Okay, another one you might want to use is the duplicate remover. So it's basically um, performing the same, the same action here. So I get the same results if I use the matcher or if I use the duplicate remover. Um, and then another one uh, that's quite new that you may uh, be interested in is the fuzzy duplicate remover. And it's a variation of the fuzzy string matcher. If you go onto the FME store, you'll be able to download that. It basically allows you to do fuzzy matching. So it would um, check your data and then there's a filter ratio that you set, which says, um, at which level you recognize them as duplicates. So the higher you set this level, the more similar um, the values have to be. So an example here would be Tesco and Tesco's. Um, with this kind of filter ratio, so 95%, it would probably find those as a duplicate and output just the one, and so on. So quite a useful one. If you're familiar with Soundex, it's the same type of thing. It's using the Java libraries and um, some functionality there to, to do some fuzzy matching. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Um, I'm then writing out two CSVs here, uh, an accounts and a contacts file. Um, what I do want to point out here is that in 2013, there will now be a Salesforce writer. Um, and that's going to be really useful. So I've realized that I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to have time to demonstrate this. But um, sugar. Disappeared. Okay, what I can do is just show you um, a link to it uh, off the FMEpedia site where you can, if you have a license to your Salesforce accounts, you can download um, a video which shows you how to prepare it um, so that it goes up through their FME server demo um, and onto Google Earth. Uh, you can also just use the uh, Salesforce writer itself, um, so it's quite useful. Okay, and last thing I wanted to, to go through with you is an example um, of some complex attributes. Okay, so this, the complex attributes are working with lists, really. And what are lists? Why would we want to use them? Well, they allow us to have more than one value for an attribute. Okay, so it's a one-to-many relationship that it allows. 
Um, some scenarios produce this data, so if you think an address record has multiple address elements, and there can be a varying number of these for every address record, so we'll say like this example here at the bottom. Um, an example, another example that I was going to show is a hen farm. So we have nest features, and these can have multiple eggs, and you can have a varying number of these eggs for every nest. Okay? So some, sometimes our data, that's how it is. Other times, when we use certain transformers, they'll produce lists as their output. So we need to know how to manipulate um, this output to be able to, to get what we want to achieve from our process. So some of the transformers that produce list outputs are things like the area on area overlayer, attribute splitter, or indeed the joiner that we've just had a look at. Okay, so this is what they look like. It's generally list with curly brackets, and then we'll have a list of the attributes that are associated with it. A list can contain multiple attributes. Each attribute in the list can contain a set of values. These are termed the elements. And these are the things that we're trying to expose, and we want to add these as attributes, typically. And the thing to remember is that the element numbering starts at zero. So the first element, if we want to reference it, we use a zero, one for the second element, and so on. Okay, and we've got lots and lots of transformers that deal with lists in FME. So there's a whole category list in the transformer gallery. I've listed just some of the ones here that I was planning to use. So we've got things like the list indexer, list concatenator, list exploder, and so on. Okay, so I have two examples here. Hopefully we'll get time um, to go through them both. The first one's a simple one, which is demonstrating it, and if we have time, we'll do the second. So the first is with an address gazetteer, and we want to work with the address elements. Okay, so we... This is our data here. We can see we've got some address lines, comma separated, varying number of address elements per record. Um, and we want to set up an organization attribute, so that's the first element, and then we want to look at removing some duplicate elements like what we can see here. Okay. You know what, let me just go and get the version that's completed because it do, will um, be quicker. Okay, so here we've got our um, CSV file that we've written in. We, we saw on the PowerPoint that it's got some address lines. The first thing we want to do is use this attribute splitter to split those address lines okay, into their different elements, and we're doing that with the comma. So we're saying at every comma, split it. This produces a list, you can see here, which is going to have each of those address elements with it. So let's just quickly show you what that looks like. Okay, so in our logger we've got the entire value and then we've got each of the list elements. Okay. But you can see that those list elements, they're not exposed as such here. Okay? But we're going to use these transformers to, to work with them. So let's enable this again. So we said we want to set the organization field, and we can see that that's always the first element. Okay? So if we want to extract a certain element from our list, we can use the list indexer, and we choose the element number that we want. Um, so here it's the first one, so it's zero. And then all I'm doing here is setting the name. So if we run this, we should now see an organization field which has that first element in it. Okay? Okay, so next thing we wanted to do was have a look at where there's duplicates in our address elements. So we can see here that this element is Exeter and this element is Exeter. And we want to remove those where they exist. So that's what we're doing in the second stream here. So the list duplicate remover, you simply tell it the list to search for and it will remove duplicates. So let's just run that. Okay. 
go up to that one that we know has got some duplicates with, ah, with Exeter. Okay, and we can see here the double Exeter, and now we've got just the single Exeter. It's removed that one. Great. So now that we've kind of cleaned up our address elements, we'd like to stick them all back together again to produce a nice clean address. So if we use the list concatenator, it's going to allow us to concatenate elements, and those elements come from a list. So here we choose our list. We're going to separate them by character, and you get the idea. So now when we write out our data, we're going to get a concatenated value that has the new, I go to our example, the new shorter cleaned up address. Okay, so I'll make a go at, at um, starting this example. It's a little bit um, contrived. It is quite an involved one, but I just wanted to show you some of the um, some more of the list transformers and the power that they have. Um, but I will understand if people need to, to drop off and and, and go because I am going a bit over time. But this oops, is the last example, and it's an example. Um, looking at some hen farm data and looking at the performance or yields, trying to calculate that from it. So what we've got is some nest um, records and then some egg records and they relate to the nests. So it's a one-to-many relationship and we want to calculate some stats for the farm. So it's a little contrived. The point is to demonstrate many list transformers, but you can think of it in terms of maybe sales and um, a stores and sales performance statistics or something like that. Um, but here I'll, I'll be talking about nests and eggs, even though it's not Easter. Okay, so oh, I'm going to stop clicking. First thing we're going to do is join the nest and the eggs together. Okay, we're going to use joiner and that's going to produce a list. And then because we've got a list, we've got to use these list transformers. So we're going to calculate some stats per nest. What I'll probably do is skim over some of these and just point out the, the more uh, important ones. And then we want to calculate frequency. So ultimately what we're trying to do is say, well, which day has got the highest frequency of eggs um, laying? Okay, and this is what our data is looking like. You can see it's just lots of numbers. We've got some dates in there as numbers and so on. Let's give it a go. Again, I'll just run to the completed one and really just show you some of the transformers. And my point here is to try and get you familiar with some of the list transformers um, so that then you'll remember them or can go and, and work with them yourself. So I've got my nests. Here I'm joining in the eggs data set. So exact same as we did a minute ago, we've got a joiner and we're referencing the, the eggs file. So I won't go through that. Here, just for the purposes of the demo, I'm putting in a sampler. So I'm uh, sampling just, it doesn't want to display. I'm sampling just five records. So this is just to, to demonstrate purpose. And coming out of this joiner, I have my list. Okay, so it's the eggs list, because I've named it that. And then you can see I've got all the attributes associated with those. And each of those attributes will then have a number of elements. Okay, so if I want to calculate the number of eggs in each nest, then I've got this list element counter, so it's counting the number of eggs elements that I've got. I then want to calculate some stats for the data set, so I can use that stats calculator that we saw earlier, so I can get the maximum, I can get a sum, and I can get an average. Okay, I can also then use a list summer to calculate totals on the elements in the list. So here I'm trying to calculate the total number of incubation days per nest. Um, if you ignore that, the thing to remember is that we're using a list summer. So remember that there's uh, a means for you to sum things together or get totals from your list. And then here I'm just calculating an average and I'm doing that with the expression evaluator. So pretty standard. Um, we had a look at it earlier, so I won't look at it now. Okay. 
The one that I think is quite interesting is here calculating the frequency and it's the list exploder that I want to, to point out to you. Okay, so the list exploder, at this point here, all our records are nests. Okay, that's the, the features that we've gotten here, they're all nests and we've attached information about eggs. Using the list exploder here forces or pushes all the eggs uh, onto our data set. So at this point, every record now becomes an egg as opposed to every record was a nest. And if I listen to myself, that sounds bonkers. But basically, I'm now exploding my data set. So where previously I may have had five records, I will now have perhaps 20 records coming out of here. So let me just run it and, and I'll keep going and we'll see it, see it as it comes through. Okay, so here I've got five and at this point I've now got 20 records. So these are the 20 eggs referenced by that to those five nests. Okay, really useful one with, with lists. We've then got an attribute copier, which is just copying in and we're saying the day. And another really useful transformer here is the date formatter. Okay, and we saw that our date was calculated in digits, okay, in numbers. The date formatter here, again, if you look through the transformer description, you'll find loads of information. But if we use this symbol, so percentage in A, it will extract and give you the day in terms of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever, that that egg was laid on. So the date that that corresponds to. So it's really powerful, um, really useful tool. Here we're just deciding, right, I'm only interested now in keeping the day because that's what we're working with. And here I'm now building a list because I want to see how many of the days occur. So this is doing the opposite. So we've now got a list after having exploded it. And here's the one that I think is, is useful. It's the list histogrammer. Okay? So it's allowing you to look at the frequency of the values um, that appear in your list. Um, so let's have a look at the histogrammer. You'll see here this is producing another list, say curly brackets, so it's got, going to create um, or produce a list with the histogram at the start, so we'll see here, and I'm able to see that I've got one on Thursday, two on Tuesday, three on a Sunday, two on a Saturday, and so on. Okay, so it's sorting them, well it's not sorting them, it's produced a, a histogram. If I wanted to get, say, the min or the max, I'd probably sort that, okay, so you can use the list sorter to do that, sort increasing, sort decreasing, but there's also another useful one here called the list range extractor, which allows you to do just that, so you can take the minimum and the maximum, and it's just a, an easier way of doing it. Okay, so um, we can see from this that the day that we get most of the eggs being laid is a Wednesday, okay, but this could be which day do we get most of our sales in, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so on, depending on what, what your data is like. Okay, so sorry for, for running through it quite a bit, but we, we have now reached the end, you'll be glad to know. Um, I just wanted a quick recap on, on what we've learned. So we can see that FME works just as easily with non-spatial data as with spatial data. And in fact, it has some special functionality um, that we should be aware of. And there are many, many non-spatial formats that are supported by FME and you can check the uh, format search part of the SAFE website to look for those formats. We've seen how you can interact easily between spatial and non-spatial and work with them together. And then we've been looking at working with non-spatial data, so manipulating the attributes. So some of the things uh, hopefully I've shown you are things like um, regular expressions, uh, merging and joining data sets, attribute mapping, testing for duplicates, calculating statistics, and so on. And then we looked at some of the complex attributes, so working with lists, so things like creating lists and then manipulating those list values once you have them in there. Okay, so some post-training resources. Um, you can go to our website and calc or download FME um, and, and start playing with it. You can also email us on fme at onespatial.com if you want to get a license, if you want to give us back some feedback on this training, um, or if you want to get any information on our formal uh, training classes. They're not generally an hour, which is 
why I'm feeling a little flushed. Um, so apologies for that. Um, we've also then got uh, different websites and resources that you can use, such as FMEpedia and, and so on. And then this webinar will be um, post-produced as a movie, and you'll be able to, to view it on, on our YouTube channel. And I think Hayley will be sending you around an email afterwards on that. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Thank you for, for joining us today. Hopefully you found uh, something useful, and even if it's triggered some things that you can now go off and play with um, in, in your own time, uh, then we've achieved what we wanted, I think. Um, okay, if there's any questions or anything like that, then uh, please let me know, or if you want to contact me afterwards, um, please use my email address and uh, drop me some questions and I can deal with those then.